Yes, I, I was a bit surprised when I said I'd like to do the lecture on the past at the conference on the future, and Jacob said, yes, great, you're going at the end. Um, but I think it sort of gets this topsy-turvy relationship that I want to talk about between past, present, and future. Um, I've really noticed it over the past few weeks, waking up and listening. I usually listen to 15 minutes of the Today programme, and anything more is, is too much. But I listen to the headlines, which is three in the morning. And um, what I've really noticed recently is that kind of slippage between the past and the present infecting the news. It seems quite minor at first, but then when you notice it, it really sorts of, it sorts of adds up. So to give you an example, two weeks ago, the second item was just around the time of the by-elections. Um, the second item on the headlines after the by-election news was that Rishi Sunak had apologised for the treatment of LGBT veterans who are sacked or forced out of the military for being gay. And you're waking up and you're thinking, is this, is this happening now? It was unclear in the headlines when they had been sacked. And then when you listened further on, um, whilst the news report presented it as a very recent thing, it was, a, it was on the basis of a report that the Prime Minister was responding to, which was from 1967 to 2000. Now that is admittedly relatively recent. It's not ancient history. You're looking at 24 to 55 years ago. And you'd be really irritated if it had happened to you. But it is presented as if it's just breaking news. And it's far from the only example. I think one of the most prominent is probably anything to do with the Stephen Lawrence case. It's like this constant kind of unfolding news that's happening um, as you're waking up in the morning. Um, but my ears really pricked up when breaking news was about the Amritsar massacre in 1919. And that was breaking news. So my point isn't that these are not important news events, but that the past is infecting kind of day-to-day -day -day headlines. And at the same time as that breaking news is um, going across the uh, wireless or the radio, is that the way in which... <laughs> <laughs> I do listen on my phone, honestly, I promise. Um, I know this is about the past, but I'm not that analogue. Um, the third story that morning of the Rishi Sunak apology uh, a few weeks ago was that the personal copy of Virginia Woolf's debut novel, The Voyage Out, had been fully digitised for the first time. The news report led on the fact that this would lead to insights about her mental health. And that was a significant spin to the story. Now, she obviously did have profound problems. This is a woman who, after a number of suicide attempts, put pockets filled her pockets with stones and drowned herself. Uh, she was 59, and so she clearly had a profound problem. But this, the way in which that was kind of understood was through this contemporary category of mental health. Now, that's already got this kind of expansive uh, quality in contemporary life. So it's no longer bipolar or depression. It's no longer even bad mental health. It's mental health. And then that expansive category in the present was being extended into the past, which in a way which she wouldn't have recognised um, and which don't illuminate the condition of the past. Um, so you've got this kind of creation of trans-historical categories. Um, the patriarchy's been around for a while as a category, um, but you see it used in this way. It's trans-historical. It doesn't explain the specific circumstances of women's oppression. It's kind of external to it. Uh, white supremacy is another one, Indig indigeneity. And to a degree, I think you see that with both slavery and empire, which kind of expand, and then they're almost quarantined, so you can't interrogate them. So it's difficult to almost have a conversation about when slavery ended in particular circumstances or began, and differentiations between empire or the periodization of empire, the British empire, is quite difficult to try and get a handle, handle on it because you have this kind of expansive uh, quality to it. And one of the most interesting examples, I think, is probably trans, which I will come on to later. So just bookmark the trans point. Um, but I want to continue looking at the way in which there's this kind of slippages between past and present in our kind of cultural and literary life. So in literature and culture, especially since the 1990s, you've had a strong trend for novels, television programs that are overwhelmingly preoccupied, the past, but preoccupied by the past. Some of these are really good. Uh, they're brilliant. It doesn't, that something's a kind of trend doesn't mean necessarily that it's a poor, that it's poor quality, although there are qualitative 
um, that, so, so there is something qualitatively and quite distinctive about it, which I'll go into. So Hilary Mantel is a really good example, but also Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, really beautiful book, uh, a fictionalised account of the short life of Shakespeare's son, which I find really confusing because it is written in the present tense. Uh, the most extreme example of this will probably put your noses up, which is the kind of Bridgerton or something like that on Netflix, uh, where you have these... And there's always this stock character of a feisty individual woman who's breaking out of the confines, and she might be kind of putting her nose up at the corset, which is a big kind of motif. Um, but wherever she is, in the Middle Ages, in feudal society, in Paris, in India, wherever, she's the same character. And I think the point about these people is that they are out of their historical time. Um, they are of the present. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about when we saw the kind of historically specific character first appear in terms of literature, because that itself is, a, is something that only really happened in the 19th century. It was Walter Scott, who, great Edinburgh novelist, um, who in the 19th century practically invented the historical novel, with novels like Waverley, published in 1814, and, and The Heart of Midlothian, which was published in 18. 18. It's literature that now is quite difficult to read, but it was phenomenally successful at the time. And it was uh, significant in that his historical characters were written of their time rather than in his time. So in the heart of Midlothian, he creates this girl, a pe Puritan peasant, Jenny Deans, and she's the daughter of a radical soldier in Cromwell's army. Her sister is charged with infanticide, and according to the laws of the time, that she has kept her sister's pregnant secret is enough to con condemn her to death, right? even though she's got nothing to do with the infanticide. She could save her sister by lying about what she knew, but she doesn't because her conscience is that she has to tell the truth about her sister, and her sister is condemned to death. So Scott here is reflecting the relationship between personal and social forces in a person's life with the portrayal of quite historically specific circumstances. Whereas what came before him, the 18th century novel, which were themselves a radical breakthrough about emotions and relationships, inner lives were being put on the page for the first time. But they're in historical only so much as regards choice of theme, costume, the psychology of the characters and the manners. They're written in and of and sound like they're written in the period in which they're written, if that makes sense. So I think that's a degree to what you're seeing today, characters that are out of time, um, although they have the appearance of being historical. One subtle example of reading the present in the past is Robert Harris's recent novel, Acts of Obli Obli Oblivion. Now, Harris, I'm sure people are quite, he's good. He's a very popular writer, um, writes sort of, they're almost like thrillers. They have extensive historical research. He knows his stuff. Uh, this one is about the real-life event of the manhunt for the murderers of King Charles I in the 1660s after the restoration of the monarchy. And I think it's really interesting that this period around the Civil War and coming out of it has long been, uh, well, for about 40 years, I think, been a publishing dead zone. It's not like the Tudors where you could publish anything or write anything or broadcast anything on them and people would come. Publishing, the publishing world has been reticent to do so. Um, academics are publishing slightly different. Um, it, so it's really curious because the Civil War is obviously something, and that period is something that is of foundational significance to Britain and Ireland, um, more than America, more than Australia, where they're still sort of spoken of. I mean, in Australia, you go to Australia and they talk about the Glorious Revolution, uh, but they don't, I don't think that sort of is a term in which that period is discussed today. Um, it's Michael Foote's father who famously asked the question, on which side would you have fought on the Battle of Marston Moor, which was the great civil war battle fought between Cromwell and the royalist Prince Rupert, which was a turning point when Cromwell, Cromwell kind of defeated them and took the north. He gained control of the north country. So the answer then, key to understanding the sort of political position of people in this country was, were you cavalier or roundhead? So it's key to understanding the modern concepts of Britain, concepts such as toleration, freedom of conscience, the constitutional monarchy, the Church of England, and I would say probably all subsequent revolutions, French and American. They have their seeds in this period, but for decades, 
despite that, had been thought too complicated and bloody to write about it. Well, that's gone. There's been a flurry of books. As with Harris, you've got Anarchy's The Restless Republic on what life was like, and it's a sort of what everyday life was like under the 11 years when Britain had no king. Paul Lay's Providence Loss on Cromwell's Protectorate, and Jonathan Healy's The Blazing World, which begins with the first line, the 17th century was a tough time to be alive. <laughs> now, Healy is being playful. He likes bum jokes. He's a very playful guy, and he's playing, he's kind of leaning in to the context in which the only way you can talk about the past is by saying how bad it was. Uh, but all these work on this period, I think, are, begs the question, why now? And what does it tell us, really, about that period and how we understand its influence on the present today. It's obviously, new, obviously good that new work uh, is being published, but I would suggest that there's a sort of subtle forgetting going on and a rewriting of that period. Um, and it's very subtle. It's nothing like the 1619 project. It's almost like a kind of silent forgetting and reading the present, reading the past to the present. So Robert Harris puts the reason why he wrote his book and the kind of flurry of publishing of books in this period down to the power of now, not because of toleration, conscience, or the rest of it, but what he says is this, and he caveats it, I didn't write this novel in order to comment on post-Brexit Britain and its divisions, but I suspect that something about this period drew me to it, and it's commonly now said, it's like a common thing that's used to explain this phenomenon, that the 17th century in the particular particularly the Civil War, is a resonant uh, period to look at for a country like Britain, which is as divided as it is now. So the blurb to the Healy book says, the 17th century has never been more relevant. We face a culture war reminiscent of when the roundheads fought the Cavaliers. And I think this sort of religious language is harking back to that period is something that we do see quite a lot of, particularly from the both sides, actually, of, if you want to call it, the woke war or the war on rogue. So religion, the religion description of that, you know, Cheryl, Cheryl Jacobs was doing it last night a little bit. Uh, climate change is a new religion. Woke is a new religion. Uh, Andrew Doyle uses it as an al analogy in a, in a nice book, but I think it's, I think whilst rhetorically effective, uh, it's limited. It gets at a passionate intensity that seems to broke no reason. Um, it's also quite hard to work out what's going on now, so it's easy to reach for historical analysis. Um, but it's severely limited. It obscures more than it illuminates. Not least, and this might be, might be wrong, but the Puritans get a bit of an unfair rap. Um, if people read the, the literature on that period carefully, they will see that actually some of the most important developments in freedom of conscience actually do come for the Puritans, and it's a fascinating question to ask why. You know, these are people who believe that God controlled every sort of move they made, um, and yet they're suddenly, at some point, having probably through their own self-interest to articulate uh, concepts of liberty of conscience. So, in many ways, we are living through very interesting times, but they are not. It's not a rerun of the English Civil War. And to kind of compare it in the way that people do, I think, is both to do that a disservice and to not understand it. And this is not just a pedantic point, because it's so foundational. Um, but it's also to avoid engaging in the present with what is actually happening. So just to kind of be a little bit pedantic, there is no supernatural being, <laughs> there's no ancient text in work, there's no forgiveness or redemption or afterlife, and it holds no promise of the future whereas religion kind of promised one, even if you had to be dead to get there. For me, and this is possibly because it's been my area of specialism for so much time, the most egregious slippage between past and present, when we get confused about what is past and what is present, um, can be found in museums. And I'm sure you've probably all experienced this in some way. Um, just last year, you had the cancellation of the Medicine Man collection at the Wellcome Trust because it was racist, ableist, and sexist. And the interesting thing is when Melanie Keane, the director, was pushed on front row as to 
Could she give any examples of that? She was actually quite, she found it very difficult to any specifics. Um, you almost think you could do it better for her. Um, but this is sort of this kind of gesture. It's like, oh, it's just that stuff, it's that period, it's over there, it's the past. Um, like the historical novel, it's worth noting that museums are historically constituted and did play a key role in ordering the past at a particular moment. So they develop initially as cabinets of curiosities, strange collections of objects, which through the scientific method and the voyages of discovery become a lot more ordered. And there's a sense in which we are ordering things. But at that early stages, you know, when the British Museum opened, for example, it was mainly artificial curiosities taken from the Cook voyages. There were no kind of Elgin marbles, no antiquity. That was discovered um, in the 19th century. And that's when they started to collect antiquity and also go excavate it from the ground. So those amazing Assyrian sculptures that are in the British Museum were taken then from the ground by August Layard in the 19th century. Forgotten uh, and excavated. They were also, that's when you get these sort of debates about whether you should leave them as ruins which I think sort of related somewhat to what Tim Black was talking about in terms of the romantics, but they still valued these things, even if they idealised them as ruins. They wanted to kind of preserve them as these decaying objects. It wasn't so much as it is today where the value of them doesn't seem to exist at all. But during this period, many museums, European, Canadian, American, were built to valorise that antiquity and to order it Crucially, to periodise it, to put the dates down and to assess different periods. So the Danish antiquarian Rasmus Nyerup observed that the National Museum, and this is sort of, there was obviously a lot of kind of national museums to give the idea to national heritage, was built as an asylum for slowly disappearing ancient national monuments, a temple for the remains of the spirit, language, art and power of our past where every patriot can study the successive advances of the nation's culture and customs. So there's this sort of sense that each nation has these customs and cultures and there's a kind of successive, almost thread, um, linking up to the best. Or you have this concept of universal human creativity that's expressed by uh, George Fisk in America from Princeton who explained in a talk how to go about founding museums. And he's very much influenced by the German model and it's the German model in the 18th century that you really had the beginning of periodization in art with a man called Winkelmann. Fisk Comfort championed this sort of Germanic model, a museum organized around the history of art. And he thought it should be enjoyed as a set of illustrations to a universal history rather than as manifestations of sort of isolated, beautiful objects. He said, a work of art thus studied historically, has other charms besides its own intrinsic merits as a beauty of composition, colour, form, execution or expression. It serves as a link in the great aesthetic development of the human race and thus aids us to see the unity of art from the building of the first pyramids down to the present line. So again, this amazing sense of progression. So today, rather than extend or delineate time, rather than have a sense of progression or relationships, contemporary museums compress and elide the past and the present. Uh, periodization itself is seen as a problem. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the Burrell collection. I don't know if anybody's been, but... Did you like it? Yeah, okay, well, I hated it, but... <laughs> Everything has changed. So they've just, it's just won the Art Fund Museum of the Year award for this. And it's still very beautiful. And she's got a tremendous collection. Uh, Chinese ceramics are a particular thing uh, for it. Um, and it's in this beautiful country park. Um, so it's, it's still very nice. But one of the first things you, well, no, let me say about this point about periodization. So you've got this bust, this Roman bust of a young man. And it was obviously sort of inspired by the Greeks. And the, the label, and when I talk about labels, it's much more important as because it's a reflection of how the institution sees these artefacts and what they're for and how to order them. So the label says, Roman artists copied Greek sculptors 
who used mathematical formulas to work out what they thought were people's perfect proportions. This has wrongly been used to promote racist ideas about the ideal proportion of faces. So nothing about the Greek ideal of beauty, nothing about the difference between Roman and Greek sculpture, which is fascinating anyway, because the, you know, the Romans are all smooth, and the Greeks are all kind of off-white and slightly imperfect. Anyway, nothing about that. Uh, it's a tremendous slur on the Greeks and the Romans. But the most egregious example is their treatment of Chinese ceramics, which is one of their best parts of their collection. It's extensive. Uh, Obviously, you don't get very many dates um, or profit. I mean, China's a really big place, and you've got no sense of where they came from in time or in place, in geography or in period. At the entrance to the museum, though, you are presented with a ceramic figure of Guayin. It's a Chinese bodice of Ita, and uh, this is a being that turned down Nirvana to stay uh, among mortals to help them be enlightened. It's a nice figure. It's green, white, gold, very peaceful. Looking now next to the ceramic figure, it says, trans people have always existed. <laughs> trans people have always existed next to this Chinese bodice of Ita um, and are rooted in history. And then it goes on. So figures like this, you know, trans people deserve human rights and all the rest of it. I'm not, I'm not so concerned. I mean, my interest is not in the trans rights stuff. It's the way in which this contemporary category of something that we're all trying to grapple with. What does it mean? What does, where did it come from? What does it mean? Is imposed into the past like this. And I think what it does, apart from it kind of does a tremendous kind of, it doesn't help you understand the conditions or the meaning of those objects uh, then and what they meant for the people. It prevents you from engaging with the present, strangely, because it just imposes this category uh, hundreds of years back. So I think this contributes to erasing the temporal distinction and sensibility that used to be part of the museum's uh, raison d'etre. And it's a way of illustrating what my main point is, which is that we're living in times which is deeply uncomfortable with the past, not just its specifics, but its very existence. Um, now, the past has long been a political resource. If you study artefacts, in fact, you will see, you know, Napoleon looted them, and in uh, Europe to kind of mimic the Roman triumphs. So he's following in the footsteps of the Romans. Some of you may have been to, to that uh, mosque cathedral of Cordoba. It's an Islamic mosque. And um, it was converted into a Christian cathedral in the 13th century. Now, I say it wasn't really converted. <laughs> they took the, the cathedral and plonked it on top of the mosque. It's a very clear demonstration of power and the politicization of the past. The vision we have today of the Parthenon, of the sort of building on top of the Acropolis in Athens is a 19th century construction uh, that the rulers of the Greek state, the Germans, created when they took everything that was post-ancient down, including a mosque. I.e. the point is here is that the past has been used. You know, we've, uh, the past has been used by leaders to authorize themselves by either promoting them kind of relationship that they have with antiquity by saying my past is more important than yours and plonking it over them. But that is not what is happening today. It's the very idea of the past. It's not a past, it's the past. Um, and as a result, I think we're kind of, it's almost like it's being erased to the extent that it will no longer exist and therefore we become <coughs> threadless or rootless, as the Goethe um, quote would suggest. So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at how we got here and what it actually means. So at the heart of the problem is the relationship between the past, present, and future. They've long been linked in theories of change. First, you had the cyclical theory of history. So what is the driver of history? How do we get from here to there to the future? Cyclical theories of history provoke propose that historical events and patterns repeat themselves in cycles. Uh, the theories link the past and the future by suggesting that the future will resemble historical periods. So for Plato, the great year theory, civilizations rise and fall in 12,000 year cycles, influenced by celestial motions. Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West, 1918, argued that civilizations have a limited lifespan akin to biological 
organisms. They go through birth, growth, maturity, and decline, similar to plants, animals. And um, according to the cheerful Spengler, civilization was already in the last stages of decline. Or more recently, you've got the Swedish-American philosopher, Benedict Beckheld, who tracing the ideas, um, idea of intellectual self-contempt back to the beginning of Western civilization. This is obviously quite an interesting in relation to Goodwin's, I'm not saying this is what Goodwin is saying, but there is this kind of constant theorizing about where Western uh, intellectual self-contempt does actually come from. Um, he argues that it recurs cyclically from ancient Greece and Roman Empire to the early modern France and England to contemporary America. Um, and he argues, obviously, it's a technological breakdown that, or technological development, that old, that great kind of explainer away of anything um, is central. The second theory is the one that we heard quite a lot about this morning from Tim Black, the Ashatakal theory of change, the idea that the belief of historical events are driven by a divine or supernatural plan that unfolds according to a predetermined end or purpose, um, as Tim was talking about with the Book of Revelations. And it's often, I think, certainly in the 17th century, how many people did view their, their time, the Welsh Historian James Howell said in 1647, as a way of understanding the turmoil, God Almighty has had a quarrel lately with all mankind. For these 12 years, there have seen the strangest revolutions and horridest things happen, not only in Europe, but the world all over. The world, he thought, was off its hinges. That's that great sort of line that I think Christopher Hill then later takes, which is, the world is turned upside down. Or as Cromwell put it, God made them stubble to our swords at that decisive battle of Marston Moore, a man who never fought without God on his side. The third theory of change that linked the past, present, and future is our old friend Hegel. One of the most influential 19th century of uh, theorists of universal history made a very clear distinction actually between the past and history. True history, he said, begins at the point where rationality begins to enter the worldly existence. The point of departure of history is when events interpreted and recorded of history were, are kind of human. It's basically the enter of the human being. Today, rather than any kind of link between past, present and future, and any kind of theory of change, uh, I think that link itself has been sundered. It's sort of dissolved, really. We no longer live inside of history. The past enters every day. It determines what we're doing. It's breaking news. We have no future. We can't understand our present. We have no, I think, very little sense of really... We know things are happening, but it's very difficult to understand what they actually are because we're sort of outside of history. I'll give you a few examples of this. Some of it is explicit. Uh, much of it is implicit and kind of almost unconscious. In the current New Yorker, Bill McKibben, uh, a scholar in environmental studies, writes about how he is traveling across, America, across Europe and coming across the sheer density of human history in corners, older, older corners of the world. So he's an American traveling through Europe at the moment, he meets the ruins of a castle in Bratislava. And this is a castle which has been a strategic point for people for millennia. People have settled there for millennia. They've traded, they've built things, they've built this castle. The ruins are still there. Now, Americans have long um, been interested in this kind of... Uh, the division between the old world of Europe and the new world as it was... Uh, of America, and you can really see this in the novels of Henry James, where you know, say something like a uh, portrait of a lady where Isabel Archer, the heiress to a great fortune, marries a decaying, old, horrible, cold man who loves, um, I think they live in Italy, and loves these beautiful old objects, and there's something very attractive to her, but the kind of the robust crass journalist is the kind of the American in the novel. And so there's a sense you're losing something, but not, not everything. So America's always been kind of interested in that. Um, this is obviously much later. Here is what McKibben writes about his experience in um, Bratislava. There's history, and there's history, the, the second being capitalized. And it's possible that, that the second is what we are living through. The ebbs and flow of history come in much grander scale, and the heat currently on display around the planet 
is, co is consonant with that much kind of grander change. And what he's talking about is that the history of the, of the environment is a bigger history. He's using it in a kind of active sense. It's longer, it's more deterministic. Um, it, the kind of, the sediments of cathedrals mean nothing against the climate. Um, there's something almost kind of pleasurable for him in it. It's not the kind of Byronic lamentations about the ruins of antiquity. There's something kind of um, pleasing. Uh, maybe I'm being a bit unfair, but there's something, there is no sense that this is a, that the ruins are beautiful. It's more like they are lost, they're nothing compared to nature. Uh, not, morally, not only morally, but in terms of significance. Elsewhere on the bookshelves, groaning, you've got the long histories that reach back past human society, the geology, the rocks, um, and identify other drivers of history. So Jonathan Kennedy's pathogenesis, which is a kind of quite overt uh, sense of this, explores how germs change the course of history. The modern world, he says, was shaped by microbes as much as men and women, and we're probably all familiar with uh, writers like Jared Diamond, this kind of determinism, this history really, this non-history, this history of the planet, uh, not the history of human beings. Where you do get the history of human beings, it's micro. It's, it's the details on a dress on a woman in the 17th century who lived in Denmark on this street. You know, it's not, it's not incorrect, but there's no sort of, this person is not really in the sweep of anything Bigger. And I think perhaps in this context you can see something happening with the rehabilitation or the, rather the interest in the 17th century. And I think the thing that is diminished, you get quite a lot on global warming in the 17th century. You get quite a lot on culture wars, which is really uh, read through the present. You get a lot on day-to-day -day living, all of which is interesting. But what you don't get is how essential that period was to our foundational uh, political and social categories. Uh, the way we have lived since an organised society. So how did we get here? Well, Tim Black very helpfully touched on quite a bit of this in his session. I think it's quite interesting just to think about that Victorian period where there was that interest in the deep past and antiquity. I think there was still this quite confident sense of what could be built. I'm sure you can point out many problems with the Victorian attitudes towards the masses and all the rest of it, but there was still this sense of uh, not only building, but a future. And I think that's gone by the turn of the century. Um, and it's never quite um, regained. And you get that tremendous sense of loss, particularly in the right, uh, writers in the right in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, the Death of the Past by Robert Plum, but also um, Civilization by Kenneth Clark. I don't know if you've seen that, 1969. Magnificent, actually. I mean, uh, but what a, what a sense of loss that he, he's just seeing everything crumble. It's also interesting that it's um, presented as a personal view, although it's often caricatured as this. The writer often caricatured, actually, as holding on to tradition and all the rest of it. You can see they've already kind of lost it uh, by then. I think in the 1980s, they begin to embrace something that's much more akin to heritage. And you have these sort of... I think there's, you know, after the miners' strike, some of the mines are opened as museums and this kind of heritageification of society. And then we have labour. I think labour is quite important, um, actually, in relationship to the way they tried to find to, to define themselves against the past. So they had to call themselves new uh, with the absence of any sort of indication of where they were going necessarily. Uh, they had the third way. They got rid of Clause 4. But then in a way, that's a war in its own past, isn't it? Um, and I think perhaps parties for some time have legitimised themselves by having a war on their past. Perhaps you even saw that with Cameron and the Tories um, in relation to gay marriage. So you've had the 1980s attempts to manufacture heritage. 1990s, you have the first apology with, the Jap with Japan apologising to China. And then you have a rush of apologies. You've got Clinton, Chirac and Blair apologising, um, in this case, for the potato famine. He's the first Prime Minister not to visit the British Museum, which is quite significant. I don't know if you remember Cool Britannia, this real attempt to kind of distance, mo appear modern by distancing from the past. And now we are where we are, which is that 
It's no longer a question, really, of distancing from the past, but the past is all around us, and yet there's also a war on it. So we are out of time, as in, well, as in we are out of our place in time and out of our place in history. So this session is titled Reclaiming the Future from the War in the Past, and like Tim, I'd hoped that Frank would um, indicate what the future should be. Um, on Friday. Um, but he did open a door of thought. I think it goes without saying we have to understand the past properly, and not in a pedantic way and not in a swatty way, but seriously. Um, Tim, preserved, Tim talked about preserving what is valuable and precious, um, and I agree with that. Joe Williams, in the last session, asked Matt Goodwin. Um, I think she made the point, actually, that the problem is there's a crisis of the purpose within institutions, um, which I don't think he quite picked up on. But I think the important thing with all the kind of stuff around identity and woke, the crisis of purpose comes first. You can see it in the late 60s in institutions. So that is something that needs to be dealt with. Now, I think it's really important not to then do what I think some people are doing, which is remoralize the past in a, it was quite good, actually. Not everybody died. Um, it was, you know, some people like being peasants um, type thing. Um, I have a lot of time for Nigel Bigger and the book on colonialism, but I think it's, uh, I think it's the wrong way. The thing is not to remoralize the past. Um, understand it. In fact, James Hartfield's written a book on empire, and it's strange because in a way it seems quite radical because what he tries to do is periodize it and explain what the different periods were. Um, so I think there's something to be done that. But uh, in terms of the present and the future, I think one of the most interesting things about the times we are living in and its challenge um, is that it's really difficult to describe. It just time, I mean, it's this sense of, I suppose that we were talking about earlier with this sort of permanent crisis, which means you're never able really to look at the ground you're in or describe the times you are living in. And I think we need to find ways to actually describe and understand the present. It's a paradoxical thing, but in president, presentist times, I think that's what we need to, be do, need to do. I was really struck, and I'll just finish on this, I was really struck at the beginning of this year. So Rachel Whiteread, uh, the artist who did the inside of buildings, house, she uh, complained that the fourth plinth, which is this roving plinth with um, different artifacts on it. Every single kind of sculpture, bar two in 20 years, none of them have found a permanent home, um, including hers, which is the inside of a plinth. It's quite clever. Um, and she says, permanence has become, is obviously impossible. Let's just give up. Let's just not have anything more on that plinth. Um, and it just made me think that actually the point about monuments that everybody wants to pull down isn't that necessarily about the, isn't that they are about the past, they're about the future, because they're basically saying, remember this. They're a kind of commitment to the future, and that, I think, is something that we find very difficult to do. Now, lest that be taken as me saying we need to build monuments, I don't think that's what we need to do, but I do think we need to find ways of describing the times we are living in and give the present some sort of shape. Thank you.